today, chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. And in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul has been talking to the church in Ephesus, uh, reminding them how in their church congregation, they had people who grew up as Jews, right? And they had people who grew up as non-Jews, Gentile people, right? And Paul is highlighting this amazing thing that Jesus has done in bringing together these two groups who really didn't want anything to do with each other, didn't have much to do with each other, kind of looked sideways at one another. But in Christ, he brought them together and is now building them together as one beautiful church together. And he's giving them a challenge and ideas about how they can live their life together as one church. Uh, so he concludes chapter 2 with these words. He says, So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, and I think he's talking especially to the Gentile Christians, but now you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, in Jesus... The whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. You know, I think if Paul turned in this section as an English paper, uh, the teacher would be like, Paul, you got way too many metaphors going on here, okay? Like, look at this. So says, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens. So that's kind of the metaphor of a nation, right? He's using that idea. And then he says, members of God's household. Now it's a family he's talking about. And then when we get down here, he's talking about a building being put together, the temple. So he shifted again. And he kind of sneaks some body language in there too, which he's going to talk about in chapter 4. But I think he's already anticipating like a body grows, right? Buildings don't grow. Buildings get built and added onto, but they don't themselves grow. So, uh, but we have all of these different metaphors coming together. And they're all true about the church. And today we want to focus in specifically on how we are the temple of God. And so I want us to watch about a four-minute video from our friends at the Bible Project, and they're going to provide some great history and context as we think about the temple today. If you could go back to the city of Jerusalem during Bible times, the biggest thing you'd see is the temple. This beautiful building was designed by King David and built by King Solomon, and they believed that it was the home of the God of the universe. Wait, I thought God's home was in heaven. Well, the whole point of this earthly temple is that it's the place that overlaps with God's heavenly home. The temple is where God lives and rules all creation as king. That's cool, but even Solomon, who built the temple, didn't believe that it could contain the God of the universe, right? Yeah, the building was just a symbol, and it pointed to the fact that all of creation is God's temple. And that's actually what the first page of the Bible, Genesis 1, is all about. Really? It says that creation is God's temple? Well, it doesn't need to say it. The whole story shows it. In Genesis 1, God creates an ordered world out of a dark wasteland by speaking in a series of seven days. Then on the seventh day, God's presence fills creation as he takes up his rest and rule. Similarly, the tabernacle and later the temple were built and dedicated in a series of seven speeches and seven days, after which the priest or king could rest and rule in God's presence. Ah, so all of creation is where God intends to dwell. It's like his temple. Exactly. Now, turn the page to Genesis 2 and we get another portrait of creation. This one focuses in on the land. And in the center of the land is a region called Eden, which in Hebrew means delight. And in the middle of delight, God plants a garden in which God and humanity live together. And that's why the temple was modeled after the garden, filled with imagery of gold and flowers. The menorah symbolized the tree of life. It's the place where God dwells with his people. Oh, got it. And check this out. In the temple, the Israelite priests and Levites were to work and to keep the temple in God's presence. This is exactly the job description given to humanity in the Garden of Eden. So these humans were the first priests. 
But instead of ruling with God, they wanted to rule on their own terms, and they're exiled from the Garden Temple. And like Adam and Eve, Israel's leaders also wanted to rule on their own terms, and they too were exiled. The temple was destroyed, and this left them wondering, did God give up on Israel? Will God bring about a new creation? Well, the biblical prophets anticipated the day when God would create a new temple with a new priesthood. That's when God's presence would fill all of creation. And when the Israelites returned to the land, they did rebuild the temple. But that temple didn't turn out the way the prophets hoped. In fact, later Israelite prophets said that this temple was hopelessly corrupt. So they're still waiting for the ultimate temple. And here we come to the story of Jesus. He said that through him, God's presence and rule was coming into our world in a new way. And he presented himself as a new kind of priest. But Jesus wasn't a priest, and he didn't work in the temple. Right. Jesus said that God's presence, his rest and rule, was filling the world through his own life, death, and resurrection. Jesus was claiming that he was the true temple, and this new temple would expand out to include all of creation. That's a really big claim. And it got even bigger. After his resurrection, Jesus said that God's presence would come to dwell in and among his followers so that they would become mini temples. Communities of people where God rests and rules. Exactly. This is the Bible's vision of the church, which is described as a temple. Not a building, but people. Yeah, like when Peter says, you all are living stones built up as a temple for God's spirit to dwell. So at the end of the story, do we ever get a new physical temple? Well, not exactly. What we see is a renewed cosmic temple, just like Genesis 1. And this new creation doesn't need a temple building because through Jesus, all creation is now the place where God rests and rules the world with his people. So a temple is a place for God's presence on earth. And it's a place, a temple is, where the God who lives and reigns in heaven, that his space can overlap with our space on earth. And earth is human space, but if we go back to the beginning of the story, we see that it's also a place where God intended to live with his people. In Eden, we see, you know, God walking through the garden, right? Um, wanting to have fellowship and communion with his people. So that's what a temple is. And if we look at the history of the temple throughout the pages of Scripture, we see that the Garden of Eden is thought of as a temple. The tabernacle was a predecessor to the temple. And then you have the temple in Jerusalem. And then you have Jesus' own physical body where he's saying, if you tear this temple down, I will rebuild it in three days, right? And John says he was talking about his own body. And then finally, uh, the, the temple is envisioned as the church, Jesus' people filled with the Holy Spirit. These are all places where God wants his presence and his power to overlap with human space so that he can live with his people, among his people, uh, and bless them and reign over them. So, church, say it with me. We are the temple of God. We are the temple of God. Of God. And this, my friends, is an incredible supernatural reality. This is not something we should just be able to say and then go, hey, I hope this doesn't take too long. We got brunch to get to, you know. <laughs> this is like church. We are the temple of God. We are now the place on earth where God's spirit dwells so that he can be present in his world and he can expand his rule and reign out over all creation? Wow. Wow. This is like mind-blowingly huge, right? And we see it in other passages. The Apostle Paul says, don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple? and that the Spirit of God lives 
in you. Now, imagine if a friend invited you to go to worship with them. And as you approach the front doors of the building in which that worship service is going to take place, your friend says, now just stop a second. I want you to understand before we go in that the presence and the power of the living God resides in these people. And when we gather together, the Holy Spirit of God is present in our midst. We are his temple. Would you think twice about going in? Friends, what would you expect to experience in the temple in which the presence and power of the living God resides? If God was truly there, what would you expect to happen? There's a quote by an author named Annie Dillard that has haunted me for 20 years Annie Dillard says, On the whole, I do not find Christians outside of the catacombs, our uh, spiritual forebears who had to meet in secret. She says, I do not find Christians sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? It's madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. For the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. What if God is actually present in his people and in the gathering of his people? What would we expect to be happening there? I'll tell you what I would expect. I would expect what I read about in the book of Acts. That's what I would expect. If you told me this is a group of people in whom the living God lives and is doing his work in the world, I would expect to find exactly what's happening in the book of Acts. I would expect tongues of fire and a sound of a mighty rushing wind. I would expect it. I would expect miracles of speaking in unstudied languages. I would expect miracles of healing, of casting out unclean spirits, even resurrection. I would expect it. I would expect the gospel to be proclaimed and for people to repent and turn away from their sin and find life in Jesus and in his kingdom if God was present in his people. I would expect those same people to have their way of living completely transformed and become completely new because of what God was doing in their lives. I would expect the world to take notice and to be offended and upset at the challenge of Jesus being proclaimed as Lord over the whole universe. I would expect the world to not like it because it flies in the face of what the world wants. I would expect to see Jesus' disciples sacrificing for one another, saying it's not material possessions and money that we care most about. We care most about the lordship of Jesus, and we're going to make sure everyone in our fellowship is taken care of. No one goes hungry, no one goes without, because God is here. I would expect people who lie to the Holy Spirit to occasionally drop dead. I would expect it if God was truly among his people. And I would expect the faithful to be willing to die in the service of Jesus. That's what I would expect among the temple of God. 
And that's just the first seven chapters of Acts. So if that's what we expect, is that a description of Valley Christian Church? If God truly lives among his people, if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, is that what we are experiencing together? And if not, why not? As I was preparing for this sermon, brothers and sisters, I'm afraid I have more questions than answers. I have a deep conviction that for the temple of the living God, there's more. There's more that we should expect. There's more for us to experience. There's more for us to discover. There's more that God wants to do in us, and there's more that God wants to do through us. Amen? So I want to ask you to join me in sharing this deep conviction today. And I want to ask you, do you believe that God wants to take us deeper? That God wants to, as we read through the book of Acts, does God want to lead us into that kind of maturity, that kind of holiness, that kind of boldness for his mission, that kind of manifestation of his presence and power among us? What kind of people does God want to transform us into so that he can exhibit his presence and power in all the ways and in all the fullness that he desires to? What needs to happen in us so that God can be present in his temple to the world the way he wants to be? There's work of transformation that needs to happen in us. And let me suggest two dynamics today. First, there is an individual dynamic because each one of us is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage each one of us to be committed to walking less according to the flesh and more according to the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6, the Apostle Paul is talking about this dynamic, particularly thinking about uh, sexual purity, because that was a problem in the church in Corinth. So Paul says, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. God cares what we do with our bodies, church. It's important to him. God cares about our holiness, that we are striving and trying our best and making an effort through the Spirit to walk in holiness with him. So let me ask you today, what is it that hinders our receptivity to the Spirit? What is it that prevents us, short-circuits us from living fully in the presence and power of God? Can you think of things in your life that are contrary to what the Holy Spirit wants? I'm thinking of things like recurring sin in our lives. If we're going towards sin, we're walking in the flesh and we know that we are not walking according to the Spirit. I'm thinking about pride. I'm thinking about selfishness. I'm thinking about idolatry, putting other things above the living God. I'm thinking about just seeing what the world is doing and have our, having our hearts pulled in that direction and to say, you know what, that looks fun, that looks interesting, that looks great. I'm going to pursue that instead of what 
the Holy Spirit wants. Because friends, what the Holy Spirit wants is death to self. Why? So that there is room for the Holy Spirit of God. The more I'm filled with Brad, the less room there is for the Holy Spirit. Brad has to die. So that God's presence and power can come and live in me and through me. What makes us the temple of God is his presence and power through the Spirit. So a few more instructions from various scriptures. The Apostle Paul says, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. That's something that God's people should want, should desire. We were singing before, Abby, about how desperate we are for it. Are we desperate? Do we see it as a matter of spiritual life and death? And do we realize that without God's Spirit, we're doing nothing of eternal significance? Only through His Spirit do we do any ministry that really matters, that really glorifies God, that really brings transformation into people's lives. Only through the Spirit does that happen. Now, this is something that God does in us, but we can open ourselves to this work of God by using spiritual practices and being more interested and receptive to the presence and power of God. The Apostle Paul elsewhere says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit so that when you sense that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do something or when you sense that the Holy Spirit is warning you to not do something. Have you ever overridden the Holy Spirit? Have you ever been aware that the Holy Spirit is trying to warn you about something or trying to prompt you to do something and you just say, no, I'm going to do it anyway. Or, no, I'm not going to do it. Even though I can clearly hear you, God, to walk in step with the Spirit is to obey what the Spirit wants us to do. Is the Holy Spirit God? So we obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit because it's God directing us and leading us and guiding us. That's how we keep in step with the Spirit. And finally, Jesus says, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Church, we can ask God, the Father, we can ask Jesus to pour out his Holy Spirit upon us more and more, to allow us to be filled more and more. And like I said, if we pray that prayer, I believe what God will say to us is, okay, take up your cross daily and follow me. That's how I'm able to fill you more and more with my spirit. You must decrease so that he can increase. So there's an individual dynamic, each one of us saying, I want to walk more faithfully by the Spirit rather than by the flesh. And second, there's a corporate dynamic where we as a church together recognize and appreciate that our existence as a church and any progress we're going to make in God's mission is due solely to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Jason, it's not our cleverness and our talent and our charisma that's going to bring any change to these people that we love, is it? It's only the Spirit of God who does that. Now, that's not an excuse for us to not do our best. We will continue to do our best, but our best only matters when it's through the Spirit, with the Spirit. Let me end with a warning. Uh, the Apostle Paul, again, writing to a young pastor, Timothy. And Paul says, but know this, hard times will come in the last days for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers without 
self-controlled, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Is that all you got, Paul? Uh, <clears throat> but here's the line that, that arrested me, stopped me in my tracks. There are going to be people who are holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. And I wanted to know what that means. Holding to the form of godliness, but denying that there's any power. Friends, I don't want to play church. I don't want to come here every week and just go through the motions sing some songs and hear a message and come and meet around this table and then go on home and just do the same things I always do. I don't want to play church. I don't want to try to do godly stuff without God. I want to believe in and expect the presence and power of God in his temple, these people, the church. Let's declare our desire for the Holy Spirit, for God to be present in his temple. Church, are you desperate for him today? Yeah, let's stand together as we declare this. church, we're going to be singing the line, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. And we're not talking about just filling this room place, right? The Holy Spirit, fill this place. Holy Spirit, fill the place in the hearts of my friends and my family here, Lord just this room. Yes, you are here in this room, but fill our hearts with you today. today, church. you 
happening in this body of believers that can only be explained by your presence among us. We thank you, God, for this incredible gift of your spirit, your presence and power living among us. Our prayer today is for deeper transformation, for a greater awareness of your presence with us, for a, for a more powerful experience of your life among us that your light would shine out from this temple, these people, your church, Valley Christian Church in this place. You can do that, God. 